Welcome to Revelation, St. Paul, as promised in some of the videos that were posted before this but are, are later in the Revelation study. I am going to try and release all of the studies that lead up to Revelation, I believe, 11, which is where all of this stuff happened and we started doing the Bible studies digitally. And I had some people reach out to me and said, this is great. I couldn't make it into the in-person studies, so jumping into chapter 11. So with that in mind, we're going to start in chapter 1. And I'm going to go back through and we're going to touch on, we're going to go back through the content. Um that we've been through in the in-person studies, but this is for anyone who either wants a refresher and just wants to go through it again, or anyone who hasn't been through it already. So this is Revelation 1. This is the start of the book um, that intimidates so many people that is, is tough to understand, is tough in a lot of different ways. We're just going to go through um, one chapter at a time, walking through some introduction for this study in case you have never had a class with me and this is your first. I was an education major in undergrad at Vanderbilt. That was one of the things that I studied. Um, as a result, I do have a little bit of a different teaching style that I hope comes across even through these video lessons. Um, I am going to put a lot of interaction. I'm going to ask uh, some questions. I'm, I'm really hoping that you get into that discussion below. Um, more discussion than maybe in a typical class or Bible study that you've been in, because I think uh, a lot comes out of that. A lot comes out of that discussion below, um, because there are things that you guys are going to think of that I wouldn't necessarily think of, or there are places where this is going to connect to your life that I wouldn't know about, because I'm not as familiar with your life as maybe your friends are. So as you watch this and as you hopefully encourage friends to watch this and discuss in the thread, I'm going to post discussion threads below that I, I hope you do take advantage of and I hope you talk with people in the midst of those comments because I think those uh, conversations can be even more productive than, than me just talking at you. So that is uh, how we're going to go forward in this. Um, so as we step into Revelation and out of this introduction and we step into the actual content, I want to give some background for the book as a whole. And one of the things that's really interesting about this book is a lot of, a lot of the books of the Bible, where we start is we start by talking about context. And we're not going to do that here. For a couple reasons. One is that it is woven into the book itself. We don't have to talk about necessarily the audience that it was written to or the, the time or the author, although that'll come up a couple times um, because this book, it, it explains itself, it explains where it's coming from on its own as we go through. But in addition to that, it's also less dependent on context. It is written to the whole people of God, the whole church of God, so it's it's much more readily applied to us directly than some of the other books in the New Testament and in the Bible as a whole. So that's one unique aspect of Revelation. Another unique aspect of Revelation is that it is the only full book of prophecy in the New Testament. So that comes with its own challenges and its own understandings that this is, this is pointing to something that hasn't happened yet. Um, now, all of that being said, because this is this is kind of the final revelation of Scripture, the final prophecy leading us forward, while we're not going to talk about the immediate context it was written in so much, there it operates with the context of the entirety of Scripture up to this point. So you'll see, uh, I'll make references and I'll draw connections to Old Testament prophecy, to the stories that, that are told of Israel's history, to Jesus' ministry, to some of the things from the New Testament. Um, it draws on all of that context because the assumption that it's making is that if you are reading and, and digesting this book, the work of Christ has already taken place. And it's assuming that that has happened and it's also assuming that you have an understanding of that. Um, and it's, it's assuming that the reader, that the audience is familiar with and trusts that work. And that assumption is implicit throughout the book. So if, um, 
that's the background that we're operating with. Now, if you're freaking out because you, you maybe don't understand Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and the Old Testament prophets, and maybe you don't have as firm a grip on the rest of Scripture as you would like to, don't worry. Uh, if, if that context is required by our study of Revelation, I will stop and I will do my best to explain that context and to draw those connections. Um, so stick with me. I promise this is going to be accessible. Hopefully this is going to be as easy to understand as I can possibly make it. Um, some more just things about the book as a whole. It is filled with celebratory worship. And what's really interesting is we, we again and again and again get to see this co contrast between the celebration and the singing of, of saved people in heaven and the saints and, and people in the presence of God. And then it's contrasted with kind of the horrors of those who are left behind of those who are condemned, of, of non-believers. So it, it's something that happens throughout the book. We get to see these contrasts. And what I'd encourage you to hold on to is that this is the final revelation of Christ. And the whole purpose of this book is to reveal Christ and to celebrate and encourage and lift up the work that he has done on our behalf. So even in the midst of those, some of the scary, horrifying, depressing stuff that is found in Revelation, if you ever find yourself kind of weighed down by that, I'd encourage you to stop for a second. That's the great thing about these recorded videos is you can pause and reflect a little bit on the joys that the book brings to light and on the incredible joy and grace and mercy that we have in the life and work of Jesus Christ. So all of that is this background, this introduction into Revelation and I, so we went through an introduction to the study as a whole. We went through an introduction to the book that we're studying. And now we're finally going to get into the text. And we're going to do that. We're going to start in Revelation 1, 1 to 3. So I do encourage you, um, if you have your own Bible, if you have your own phone, pull it up on whatever you need. Um, that's kind of cool. I think you can see the reflection of my other monitor and the, the Atlanta United logo there. Anyway, um, so get to your text. I will have it up on the screen, the verses that we're going through. But um, the, if, if you open up in your own text, it makes it a lot easier to reference and a lot easier to, um, as I'm going through, and I, I won't have the text up there the whole time, it makes it a lot easier for you to, I guess, kind of follow along and have that before you. So we're going to start in Revelation 1, 1 through 3. And says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So, as we walk through this, it, it specifies this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is in there to, to do a couple things. One is it dispels the idea of other authors. It says this isn't something John is just making up. This isn't something someone is just making up. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is really uh, putting forward that this is from God. This is not from man. Um, and what this also does is it solidifies this as prophecy. Because Jesus would have the knowledge by which to make this prophecy. Um, and it's the culmination of all scripture. It's saying this is the final revelation of Jesus. So it's uh, to show his servants. This is God's people. This is saying this is who this book is for. This includes us. This is one of the reasons we don't have to worry so much about immediate context. Because this is written to God's people across all places and all times. This book is written for you and for me. And that is something that is awesome. You, you, it really sets it uh, apart from a lot of the other books of Scripture. Because while they are written for us, they're not written directly to us. This is written directly to us as God's people. And that is awesome. So, we go forward and it says, He made it known by sending his angel to John. This again, this says, this is from God. Angels are messengers from God. And this angel actually appears several times throughout the book of Revelation to lead John, to guide John, to explain to John what is going on so he can in turn 
write to us and, and explain to us. And then finally it says, blessed are those who read aloud this prophecy, who hear it, who keep what is written in it. What that blessing is isn't really defined right here. It's, it's just blessing. But as we go through the book of Revelation and we see maybe a little bit of the context for this, um, this is talking about the heavenly banquet, the ultimate blessing of being in heaven with God and in the presence of God. Um, and there's also some evidence throughout Revelation there are these seven beatitudes, these seven highest blessings throughout Revelation, within Revelation, that we are going to get to. So that is this little prologue bit of Revelation 1, and we're going to continue to Revelation 1, 4 through 8. And those are the next verses we're going to look at. So it says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that's as we step forward into Revelation, those are the next verses we're going to tackle. And what we have here um, are these seven churches. And seven is a number that comes up over and over and over and over again through the book of Revelation. And it's symbolic. It's important. Seven is the number of completeness. And not just completeness, but generally it's connected with divine completeness. Even going all the way back to Genesis, you have the seven days of creation. This is the number of holy completeness. Um, so he's talking to seven churches. Now, we may say, why these churches? Why this collection? Why these specific churches? Um, what we're getting at here is this as a representative of the whole church united. And then these seven churches rep uh, approach different aspects of the church, different people in the church who may be struggling with different things. Um, what I want to stress is this is not symbolic of specific parts of church history. Now you can see some reflections of each church may be more prevalent at different parts in church history, but we're not like going down a check mark and saying, oh, the church in Ephesus, that was this part of church history, and now we don't have to worry about it. Or the church in Thyatira, that was this part of church history, and it doesn't really apply to us anymore. In any given time, multiples of these churches can apply or cannot apply, depending on what the church of the time is struggling with. And as we go through to what John, what the angel, what Jesus has to say to each of these churches, what we're going to find is that it is really applicable to us as well. So we go forward and it talks about God as he who is, who was, who was to come. This covers all of time. This goes from the past to the present to the future. This is God the Father. Why they may not say directly God is because there's a lot of respect for the divine name. Um, now, when it speaks about the Father and the seven spirits and, and it uses all these ways to talk about God, it's structured grammatically in such a way that it's putting emphasis on the, uh, when it speaks in order, it's saying, like it says the Father, as first among equals. So when it talks about him who is, who was, who is to come, it's talking about the Father and it's talking about him as the first among equals with the other parts of the Trinity. Which as we go forward, it says, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. This is evidence of the Holy Spirit. And your reaction might be, but there's only one Holy Spirit. Why, this is seven spirits. What's the, what's the distinction there? And what we're seeing here is, first of all, I want to call us back to Zechariah and Exodus. Because over and over again, seven blanks seven of something represents God's presence with his people. So we see these seven spirits as representative of the Holy Spirit and of the Holy Spirit's work in and amidst God's, in and in the midst of 
God's people. So this is what the Spirit does for us. And when we talk about the seven spirits, as we go forward, we're going to see maybe seven different functions of God operating with his people, of the Holy Spirit operating with his people, and how those seven functions kind of cover everything that God does. Um, so given that evidence, um, we're going we're gonna to say that this is probably a fair way to reference the Holy Spirit. And then finally it has, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Um, so this is, this is speaking of Jesus as a faithful witness of God. This is affirming the Gospels and all that Jesus said and taught in the Gospels. And then it's going forward and it's saying he's the firstborn of the dead. This is a really hopeful thing for us because it implies that there will be more. And that's a promise that you and I get to look forward to as members of God's kingdom. Um, and then the ruler of kings on earth is his final title. And this is in a non-traditional sense. And as we go through this study in future chapters, we're going to talk about this a lot. What does it mean when we talk about Jesus as ruler of kings on earth? And how does that differ from maybe how you and I think about power and authority now? So in summary, this is the letter coming from the triune God. Uh, and as we go forward, we're going to get further in, and it says that he's made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. And this is the work of Jesus Christ. We're a kingdom for God. So here's my first question for you that's going to be in the comments below. So I'm going to ask the question, talk about it a little bit, and then I'd encourage you to pause the video and comment below and get into a discussion with anyone else who, who has commented. Um, of course, being loving and polite and kind as we are called to be as Christians. Um, so my question for you is, what does it practically mean for you and I to be members in the kingdom of God? When it says that God has made us a kingdom for himself, what does that mean? What does that look like in our daily lives? Um, so that is my question for you. Go ahead and pause the video for a second and respond to the comment below. And then once you've responded, come on, come back and uh, resume. So what we're going to do now is talk about this, this next part. He talks about making us uh, a priest to his God and Father. Um, and what this language does is, if, if you look at Old Testament priests, they were intermediaries between the people and God. They were the ones who were allowed to go into the tabernacle and make prayers on behalf of the people and make sacrifices for the people. So Christ removed the need for that intermediary. When he died on the cross, he became our intermediary before God. He, he tore the curtain of the temple in two. And we can now go before God our own. As priests, we can offer prayers. We can offer ourselves as living sacrifices on our own behalf and on the behalf of others. So that is a, a joy and a gift to us that we have been made priests before God. Um, and then finally, as we move forward, it says, Behold, he is coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him. Um, this is this is a fulfillment of, of what is spoken to in earlier in the New Testament. Uh, Caiaphas has promised that this is how Christ is going to return. He's going to come on the clouds. And then in Zechariah, it says that the Lord will pull, pour out his spirit of grace on the house of David and says, Yahweh, they will look upon me who they have pierced, which is more of this language here. It says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And this piercing, what this does is it brings to light. It brings us a reminder of Christ's death and resurrection, which again is kind of the crux of this entire book. Um, and then finally, we move forward to all tribes of the earth will wail account on account of him. And we say, why is that happening? Why are all tribes wailing? Um, and this is kind of talking about those who pierce him. Those are God's manifest enemies. And all tribes, though, are referring to God's repentant people. So we ask, well, why are God's repentant people crying? And the reality is, this is a time of sorrow for us, too. This time of condemnation, because we're seeing people, maybe people we love, who are who are being condemned in the midst of this. And that's a harsh reality that we're going to speak to, especially as we go forward. So that might be some of the reason for weeping. 
And then this section concludes, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Lord God Almighty. So this is the divine voice breaking in to again confirm authority to say this message is coming from God. Now, this tradition of the Alpha and the Omega, for those of you who don't know, those are the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. Um, but this tradition of, of speaking to God via the first and the last letters of the alphabet goes back even before the New Testament, before the Greek language was used, to Hebrew. And those were Aleph and Tav are the first and last letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and they represent something called the Shekinah. And that is God's visible presence for the benefit of his people. So when God is calling himself the Alpha and the Omega, this is, yes, a reference to God and the totality of God. But it's also a reference to a God who works in the midst of his people. And that is so cool for us. Because God is saying, I'm speaking this to you and I'm, I'm working in your midst. So we have that. And then it. We're going to go forward into Revelation 9, or Revelation 1, 9 through 20. I always do that. That is something, I, I apologize in advance because I'm probably going to consistently do it in these videos. Where I refer to the verse we're picking up on instead of the chapter and then the verse. But we're picking up in the same chapter at verse 9. And it says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, f refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the shun the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars are the seven are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So that's a pretty thick chunk of text that we're going to approach. Um, it actually it goes pretty quickly, though, because, uh, well, frankly, we haven't gotten to a lot of the, the deep metaphors and, and the harder topics of Revelation. This is kind of still an introduction. Um, so John talks about being on Patmos. This is talking about his tribulation. And part of that might be because he was likely on Patmos in exile from imperial authority. This was a time in history where the Roman Empire was not fond of Christianity. The Christianity, frankly, made too many waves. Um, so John was likely in Patmos not by choice. He was not there on vacation. He was there in exile. But it says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So this, again, this confirms this is inspired. This is authoritative. Um, and what's really cool about this Lord's day is they were already worshiping on the first day of the week, on Sunday, in, in this early Christian church, because it was a celebration of the resurrection, which is something that's really cool because even today we, we celebrate every Sunday. And one of the reasons we do it on Sunday typically is it's a celebration of the resurrection. It's that first day of the week. It's it's something new. It's something exciting. It's like new life. And uh, even in the midst of these times, that's why we, we continue to stream services. Uh, for those of you who may be watching this later, this is I'm recording this in the midst of the coronavirus. 
we still stream our services on Sunday, and when we come back, we will still celebrate on Sunday because it's the Lord's Day, and it's a celebration of that resurrection. Um, and it's also fitting because on Sunday when we worship together, it's worship's role is to bring heaven and earth together. So it's really cool that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, this time and this, this space we have set apart for heaven coming to earth for celebrating the resurrection. Um, so that's that's John's situation. And then it talks about these seven churches that he's writing to. I'm not going to talk about those right now. We're going to get to those in much greater depth later because those are the next several chapters talk about the seven churches. Um, but then we get into this image of Christ. And it talks about this, uh, this man, the son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest, so we're getting into, into this symbols, um, this imagery, first off, this golden belt, that's indicative of royalty and of Christ's place as a king. Um, the white hair is representative of uh, experience, of age, and the, the honor and respect that he is worthy of. Um, so that's what the white hair is getting at, is that he is worthy of honor and respect. The white robes and the fire that it's talking about, these are symbols of purity, and this is how the Ancient of Days is described all the way back in Daniel. He's described using this language, so this is a connection of Christ as a fulfillment of those ancient prophecies. So, and then stepping forward, he's talking about seven stars, the, the two-edged sword, um, and then the lampstands, all of these symbols that are coming together. We have the church is as the lampstand. And if you go into Matthew 5, it talks about uh, the church as the lampstand that 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 lifts up lamps that are called to be lights to the world, and then we are called to be those lamps. So, what this is really cool uh, with the church as a lampstand and that symbolism is that it connects the church to the church having the role of putting Christians forward into the world and lifting them up so that their light can shine. So it puts this church in a role of equipping people to share the gospel light and, and building people up to uh, do that. And then as we go forward, the, the reason that the church is held in and Christ is holding these is because Christ is still playing an active role in defending his, his church. And this is when it's so cool that this letter is written to us because Christ still defends his church today. Um and then it starts to talk about how his mouth came a two-edged sword. And this is, the, this is the word. This is how he rules in his church. And uh, when we speak to the word of God, we actually speak of this in three different ways. Now, of course, we have the word of God that people usually think of. That is the scripture, the Bible, the, the, the word of God. Um, and that's the written word. But two ways that the word comes to us that we don't think about as frequently is something we call the personal word, the incarnate word, and that is Christ coming as a person. He is the word made flesh. And if we go back to the beginning of the Gospels, we have that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that was Christ. So that's another form of the word that we don't think of as frequently. And then we have the spoken word. And that's when the, the Bible is read out loud. That's when it's discussed when when uh, faithful preachers preach. We're talking about the spoken word of God coming out. Um, so that is speaking to this sharp, sharp two-edged sword that is the word of God. That's how he rules in his church, even today. Um, and then it speaks about how he has the, the keys to death in Hades. This is a promise of eternal life. Right here in the front, this is getting at the core of Revelation. That is, we look forward to heaven and to a day without death. When death and Hades have been conquered and are gone. And that is what Revelation is talking about. And then finally it says, um, as for the mystery of the seven stars, it, this is explaining. And this is where I got the connections for the symbolism we just talked about. But at this point, I'm going to take a second to speak to how I am approaching Revelation. There are a lot of mysteries in Revelation. There are a lot of things that it says and it doesn't have this built-in explanation. So I'm going to do my best to explain those. 
However, I'm going to be really upfront. Some of this stuff is guessing. Some of this is based on my knowledge of scripture and on all of the background coming into this book and, and based on uh, commentaries. I, I was going to show you the commentary, but it's under a big stack of books and I, I don't want to make a ruckus. Um, so it's based on things people who are a lot smarter than me have said about Revelation. I'm going to put that before you, but I'm going to qualify it all by saying this is kind of a guess because we're not told for sure what it means. So I'm going to I'm going to put before you some theories I think are pretty good. I'm going to put before you maybe some theories that I think aren't there but are out there um, just so you can be aware of them. I am going to be very upfront with you. I am willing to say I don't know. And if you ask questions in the comments, I'm going to do my best to respond to each and every one of them. But there are going to be some times where my response is going to be, I don't know. Um, and that being said, in the midst of that, and especially when it comes to application, we're going to have a lot of discussion going forward. And that's why these comments below these videos are going to be so important and so valuable for us. Um, and for anyone, you, me, and anyone else watching these videos. So as we conclude today, um, that has been Revelation 1. I hope it was helpful for you. And I hope that you do engage with us in the comments below the video. And I hope that you share these with your friends so that they can engage and they can, they can get the good word of God, but then they can also help the rest of us as we struggle with these topics, as we talk about these topics. Um, so with that, this has been Revelation 1 and an introduction to Revelation. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.